Hi everyone. Uh, this is work that I uh, carried out with colleagues at Lausanne, Torino uh, and Dartmouth. Um, and I'm going to continue where Rachel left off. So space matters. Artificial life has known that uh, for a long time. So these are two studies, uh, classic studies. If you don't know these, go and read them. This is by Pauline Hoverbay, who is a keynote later in the conference. Uh, this one is by Ezekiel Di Paolo, who is a keynote at the next uh, A-Life in Mexico. Uh, in Pauline's work, she's looking at a system of um, uh, catalytic uh, chemical reactions. Uh, in Ezekiel's work, he's looking at agents playing a kind of cooperative strategic game, and their findings are the same. If you embed these games uh, in no space, if, if they're well mixed, then you don't get autocatalytic cycles, they decay away, you don't get cooperation, it dissolves away, but if you spread these systems out in a two-dimensional space, then they organize and you get these beautiful spirals uh, of uh, hypercycles and you get these clusters of cooperation. So my work, I'm interested in what, it is, what is it about space that is bringing about these kind of processes? I want to move beyond a well-mixed bag or spreading things out on a regular lattice. And the obvious place to go is some kind of spatial network representation for your system. The canonical spatial network is the random geometric graph. It's extremely simple. We spread some nodes at random in a space and we connect every pair of nodes that is close enough together. So there's some kind of threshold distance R, the reach of each node, and every legal edge is there in the random geometric graph. So we use this as a starting point, but what we want is to be able to control some of the interesting structural properties of these spatial networks, in particular, the strength of the community structure that they exhibit. So that's where the Graves model uh, originated. And there was a previous uh, ECAL or AI paper that presented the sort of structural properties of this network. Today I'm interested in simple processes on these kind of self-organized spatial community structured networks. So what's the Graves? Model, it's an acronym, so R is still for reach, just like in a random geometric graph. Uh, so there is a parameter R that defines the maximum edge length. E is for energy, not every edge is affordable. Nodes have a limited amount of energy that they can spend on maintaining edges. D is for the including distance between the nodes, and that's what determines or influences the cost, the energy cost of every edge. And S is probably the most important idea, which is a notion of synergy, that the cost of uh, edges depends on shared neighbors. So this node C here, uh, who is friends with A, and C is also friends with B, if A and B became friends with each other, that would reduce the cost of the edges C, A, and C, B. So in this little equation, the cost of an edge C, I, J is proportional to the distance, but it's uh, reduced, divided by uh, the shared number of shared neighbors that those two edges have, those two nodes have, parameterized by this value S. If S is zero, we recover a random geometric graph because this term is one. Uh, if S is one, then that's the maximum uh, synergy effect. So how we build a network, very simple, just the same really. We throw our nodes into a unit square, we allocate each of them the same amount of energy, we pick a node at random, we pick a node, another node that's nearby at random. If both nodes can afford the edge, we add the edge. Keep doing that until you can't add any more edges to the network. Notice that when you add edges, the cost of existing edges can change because of this synergy effect. So you keep having to reassess edge costs. Um, what's this idea of synergy? Well, for me, the easiest way to think about it is like this. So this is me at work. I have some friends at work. Sort of unrealistic, but uh, <laughs> let's just go with it. But let's imagine that each of those friendships is completely independent, right? So I meet one of my friends, I have to meet another of my friends, and another of my friends independently, right? Each of those relationships has to be maintained independently. But if there's some synergy, then when I'm meeting one of my friends, I can talk about the other one. And that's almost as good as meeting her. But my friend. Or we 
could collaborate on buying her a present, and that might be cheaper than if we both, all of us, bought a present independently. So synergy is just an idea about sort of local network effect that can encourage um, uh, triangle formation and uh, local clustering. Okay, so what does it look like? Here's an example where it's network. This is with zero synergy. So essentially this is a sparse, a sparsified random geometric graph. Right? So all of these edges are less than R, but not every edge less than R exists. They can't all be afforded. Right? So this is a nice, boring, null spatial model. Uh, it's got uh, a mean degree of three, which is obviously a lot lower than the equivalent random geometric graph. It's got some clustering, but not very much. And it's got some positive assortativity, because uh, some nodes are lucky. They're born in a dense patch, so there's lots of people that they can be connected to, and they tend to be connected to each other. Lucky nodes are, by definition, near to each other, because it's being near to nodes that makes them lucky. So that's how we get some positive assortativity. If we ramp up the synergy, uh, we start to see networks like this. Uh, so I've coloured the edges now, the blue edges are cheap and the red edges are expensive and we see much more interesting structure, right? This is the uh, same amount of energy as before, but now S has gone up to 1. So now the degree has increased because some of the edges are cheaper than they were before, more edges can be afforded, uh, we've got much more clustering, much stronger resourcivity, and we've got this evident community structure. Uh, separated by these areas, these kind of hinterland areas. So in the previous talk, what I demonstrated, one of the things, is that the location of these communities is not determined by the lucky individuals, the dense individuals. Those communities can arise anywhere on the space, and they're about being uh, having lucky wiring events rather than being spatially positioned in a lucky place. Uh, we can also compare that to, uh, you know, this has obviously got lots more edges in it than the previous one, but we can make, oops, I think maybe I, I'm missing a slide, but I can show you a slide where we give uh, an S equals zero network enough energy so that it can have the same number of edges as this, and we don't get the kind of community structure that you can see in this graph. We get a dense network that's still ordinary. So, What's nice about these networks is that they have lots of the properties we're interested in, more of them than any of these other candidate networks. Right? They've got clustering, they're spatially constrained, they've got a broader degree distribution than a regular random geometric graph. Some nodes are very well connected, so it's not a Poisson degree distribution anymore. We have positive sorcivity like in many social systems, and we have some deep some community structure. The one thing that was missing was um, short path lengths, a small world sort of effect. Because it's basically a lattice, a sort of distorted lattice, some parts of the network are very far from other parts. So the first thing we can do is show that you can easily build small worlds on these graphs. You just follow the same kind of random rewiring process that Watson Stroke has introduced. Uh, so we build a, a complete wedge network, uh, then we consider each edge and with probability P, we rewire it, and we do that by picking another random node. Uh, we make sure that it's not I, uh, one of the nodes in our edge, and we make sure that the edge between I and K doesn't already exist, and then we remove the node that we're rewiring, sorry, the edge that we're rewiring, and we add in a new edge, and we gradually erode the structure in the network as we increase P. But we have to note that this does change the degree distribution of our network, okay? Some nodes are losing neighbors and some nodes are gaining them. So we're not conserving the degree distribution when we do this, and that will be important later. So in the results that follow, what I'm going to do is build a race network and build a random geometric graph with exactly the same number of edges, the same value of R, so we can have a null model to compare. Uh, so we can see the standard uh, effect of rewiring. So here are our race networks, and here are our RGGs, random geometric graphs. As we increase the probability of rewiring until it gets to 1, we see the clustering of decay to 0 uh, because we're destroying all of those triangles. Uh, we start out here with red networks having less clustering uh, than RGGs. RGGs are the, the reach of the RGGs is less uh, to stop them, to make them have the same number of edges. So that means they have a denser uh, number of triangles. That means they're more clustered to start with. Uh, and uh, path length falls off more rapidly. Uh, the path length of uh, red networks is 
slightly uh, smaller because their reach is slightly bigger, so the number of hops between nodes is a little bit smaller to start with, but as we rewire, this falls away, and if we look at the ratio between those two properties, it peaks at some intermediate value of P, that's where our maximal small world occurs. And the small world effect is weaker in the red network and stronger in the RGG. So that's easy uh, and rather straightforward. Any lattice-like structure, if you apply that rewiring to it, you'll go through a small world regime on the way to a random graph, a fully random graph. What's interesting is, what does this structure do for processes on these networks? What I really care about is what kind of processes arise or what kind of processes can take place <coughs> on networks with this kind of special red structure. And the simplest process maybe to look at is some kind of contagion spreading on the network. Uh, so they're a nice starting point. Um, you might, there's some an analog of the spread of disease, but maybe also the spread of information, rumors, gossip, uh, and maybe the spread of innovation. Uh, some of my co-authors also look at that as a way of measuring the selection pressure in a network. Right? So how quickly could a beneficial mutant variant spread through a population? Uh, and here we're going to consider in this talk uh, contagion processes that include recovery. Uh, so we can ask questions like, will the spatial constraints that we impose on these networks limit outbreaks? Uh, will the random rewiring, because it's introducing long distance connections, will that help outbreaks to spread more quickly? Uh, and which will be more vulnerable, the RGGs or the REDs? Um, so we run a SIS process, a standard disease model. Um, we start out by infecting a random little group of nodes, and then uh, every time step, each node that's uh, infected will, at the next time step, recover with some probability. And each node that is susceptible um, has the chance to be infected by any of its neighbors uh, that are infected. And there's beta is the probability that one of your infected neighbors will infect you. And we set mu, the recovery probability, to 1. So every time, if you're infected, the next time step, you will have recovered. Uh, so it's like a very mild problem. OK, so here I have to swap to the laptop. So this is using uh, Hiroki, who is chairing. Uh, I adapted uh, some Python code, a repository that he's put together. If you have students, if you're teaching them Python, if they're interested in AI, really have a look at this. There's a massive amount of bits of code for modeling all uh, of the sort of canonical uh, AI models. It's really nice, very simple. So here on the left-hand side, I've got uh, a REDS network, on the right hand side I've built a random geometric, geometric graph on the exact same distribution of nodes. I've infected the same initial nodes and now I can run these two processes and I can show you that uh, you can see that in the RGG the, the, the infection can't do as well. Right? On the right hand side over here, very quickly it decays away and after about 35 time steps it will uh, go and sit. That accurate will fail. Whereas here, on the RG, on the red network, despite the fact it has exactly the same number of edges over the same nodes, uh, the infection can persist. And now I go back to my slides. Good. And in general, we can use, so this difference between the red networks and the RGGs is predicted by this mathematical approximation to uh, how susceptible a network will be. So this is some work by Alex Arenas and colleagues. This is uh, a critical value of beta. Remember, beta is the transmission probability. So this is uh, related to the largest uh, eigenvalue in the, of the adjacency matrix, and it's um, factored by uh, this recovery probability. So here, this uh, analytic approximation suggests that red networks will be more vulnerable than RGGs, and that as we rewire them, uh, gradually, mostly this vulnerability will remain the same, but as we, uh, as this rewiring probability gets large, they will, uh, that they will both become more resistant to infection. Right? So the introduction of random edges makes them more resistant. So the long distance edges do, does not help, it hinders. Uh, so, th but that's an analytic result. So we ran simulations on REDS networks. So here we have this rewiring probability. 
but here they are fully randomly rewired. Here's beta, and this is showing uh, how many infected nodes do we see when the run stabilizes. So here we can see this, uh, the shape of this curve that we saw in previous graphs. So things get too hard, things get harder for the infections here. Uh, we can just quite an interesting graph, there are lots of things on it. But here we can see before we rewire the networks, uh, they are easier to infect, but at these low infection rates, uh, the number of nodes that get infected is very little. So individual communities are getting infected, but, but the infection cannot spread across the entire network. We can compare that to uh, random geometric graphs. Uh, so we get a similar uh, graph, except this is largely flat, which departs from what the prediction was from the analytic result. We get the same idea that uh, over here, uh, mild uh, outbreaks can infect only a limited number of nodes. So why is that? Why is rewiring making this difference? Well, we can explore that a little bit by looking at a different style of rewiring, which I haven't got time to explain really, but it's a kind of smart rewiring that preserves uh, the degree distribution. So if we, if we decided to rewire these three nodes, we can rewire them like this, uh, and in that way, they're all rewired to a random node, but their degree stays the same. When we rerun the analytics on those, we see that we, we, the prediction is we would still see this effect, uh, but the, there will remain this gap between the two kinds, so the degree distribution is important. Something uh, was happening before this red curve used to go all the way up here because the random rewiring was eroding the degree distribution previously, getting rid of some of the very high degree nodes, and that was what was making it harder for the infection to take off. So let me just skip through uh, these results. So here this is the equivalent plot. We still see a little bit of this kind of S-shaped curve, but it's been very much extinguished. We don't see any change uh, for smart rewiring for the RGG. So let me just walk you through what's happening here. The, the point of this exercise really was to have a process that could generate par parameterizable spatial structure in networks because we might be interested in what like processes look like on those kind of systems. But before we use them in earnest, but before we maybe simulate uh, games on them or before we use them as the basis for some kind of um, uh, population process, I want to understand what those uh, structural properties confer on simple dynamics. And what we found is RAIDs with their community structure are more vulnerable to contagion than RGGs, but that's partly because uh, the spatial embedding uh, creates this community structure, um, and the long tail degree distribution that those dense communities have allows infection to take root more easily. Uh, but it's not just about this because there's still some residual effects even when we keep the degree distribution the same when we rewire. So something, some higher order structural properties, some, some correlations in the uh, degree distribution are important. Uh, when we rewire rates, we can get to a small world regime without really compromising their vulnerability to infection. Okay, you have to go beyond the small world regime before you start seeing that uptick in the uh, curve. So you can build small world red networks that have the nice mixing properties of a small world. Things can spread fast when they, when they take root, but they're also vulnerable to those infections taking off. Um, when you fully rewire one of these networks, they become less vulnerable to contagion. It's harder for contagion to get started, but if it does, it will spread very quickly because of all those random edges percolating it all over the network. So small world reds are a kind of sweet spot where uh, new information for example, can uh, establish itself in a population and can spread quickly, which is hard. It's hard to achieve both of those things. So just to finish, um, I'm interested, at the moment we've just looked at the end point of this spreading process, right? Does it fail or does it succeed? And how many individuals are infected at, uh, when it stabilizes? But what's it look like as it's spreading across the uh, network? So, one of the things I'm interested in is disease propagation across continents. Uh, when, uh, when you look at the Black Death, uh, you see the Black, the Black Death spreading linearly across Europe. Right? It takes time to get from England to 
Norway, um, and then further north. But when you look at diseases spreading in modern uh, society, uh, it can spread exponentially fast because of planes and long distance travel. Uh, so in these networks, you can see something like that. You can see uh, disease spreading very quickly within a community, exponentially fast, but it takes time for the disease to be able to move across the space, hopping from one community to another. Uh, so at what rate does contagion spread within a community and what rate does spread between communities? We can also now start to look at uh, what if you allow agents to play games on these networks. So far, we just give agents energy for free. Everyone gets E energy. But what if you had to earn your energy by playing the business dilemma? Um, how would that structure the network as the game is being played? Is it easy for a corporation to, to build and structure spatial populations that support cooperation? Uh, and also, at the moment, we have static distribution of nodes, and we build the network, uh, and then we start to play on it. But real, real networks are in constant flux. Nodes are moving around. Edges are being built and shared at the same time. Can we translate these kind of results to a fully dynamic version of uh, the model? Uh, and I will 